Kevin and Brian's Horror Drive-In Theater Podcast, where each week we cover the latest horror news, shorts, and two creature feature reviews. This week, after the news, we'll cover the old drive-in classic, The Abominable Dr. Fives, followed by our discussion of the short film, The Storm, and our modern-day horror feature film, Hellraiser Judgment. So grab some snacks, turn up the volume, and lean back and relax. Here we go. First up, the news. First, we have a new Ghostbusters movie for 2020, It's a Sure Thing. Details are still pending, but this one is set in the same universe as the first two, ignoring the reboot. And boy, Leslie Jones is unhappy about that. Oh no. She was one of the stars of the reboot. And she's letting everybody know that she does not like that idea. I never saw the reboot. Did you? I didn't. I didn't think it. Do you feel bad that you very, didn't? No. Yeah. No. I would have been a lot more inclined to see it if it had been a sequel and not a reboot. They could have done that. They could, could have, have been had their daughters or granddaughters daughter. or something. Yeah, they yeah. found the equipment and the vehicle and decided to take it up. But no, it was a reboot and. I didn't think the previews looked very good, and yeah, never saw it. So anyway, this is going to technically be the third movie in the series, even though it's the fourth Ghostbuster. Which they've been talking about for 30-ish years. Yeah. Ivan uh, Reitman, who directed the original, will be the producer, and his son Jason will be the writer and director. mm Mm-hmm. So, we'll have to see how that works out. Yeah. What about number two? Number two is the MPI Media Group, who holds the rights to Dark Shadows. That was that vampire-ish, supernatural, soap opera type Barnabas Collins. Barnabas Collins. Over a thousand episodes that ran of that. And they have uh, just finished up a documentary that's going to be released later this year. I want to see that. I I love that show. I want to see that, yeah. Uh, it's narrated by Ian McShane uh, from Deadwood and American Gods and other things. Lots of history and interviews with the creator, Dan Curtis, who's still around. I was wondering about that. He's and got to be really old. some of the actors are still around, too. Many and of the actors are not still around. Their families and people that knew those actors are interviewed. So it sounds like they're pretty thorough and Sounds very interesting. I was too little to see all of that on the first run, but I saw several years of it in rerun. Then they had a remake of Dark Shadows in the 90s that ran for a season, and it, it was pretty good, but it didn't last. And there was the Johnny Depp movie. That we was don't talk about the good. Johnny Depp movie. I, I liked the Johnny Depp movie. Yeah. It was kind of a tribute, <sighs> kind of a fun thing. You know. mm, okay. Yeah. What do we got? What else we got? Shudder, Green Lights, a creep show series. Uh, run by The Walking Dead's Greg Nicotero. Yep, this time it's going to be an anthology series with a different Stephen King story and different director every episode. Filming is going to start in Atlanta and is planned to be released later on this year on AMC. The first episode is supposed to be a survivor type thing, a not very nice guy who gets stranded on a deserted island and takes extreme measures to survive the short story is actually called survivor type i read that i read that one yeah and i I won't not read that one i won't give any spoilers but yeah pretty extreme measures so every episode is going to be written by stephen king that's my understanding based on a story a different short story by him Hmm. and it'll be that crypt keeper hosted kind of thing like the creep show movies were Let's see, the Creep Show movies had like the animated cartoony Crypt Keeper guy. They did, yeah. Yeah, that was neat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I liked those a lot. There were only two, weren't there? Was there ever a third one? No, just two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Meds Mickelson is teasing us with hope that Hannibal season four might actually happen. I thought it all wrapped up. At least there's hope of it. They wrapped up pretty much what was written uh, in the books. They took it up through, through the uh, Red Dragon storyline no, more couldn't hurt okay so it le- the old series left fans wanting more even though it was mostly done meds says he'd certainly want it to continue but he doesn't know any details as the talks are still ongoing it's above his pay grade as he put it <laughs> but he would be aboard he, he's all in favor of it i can't wait to eat that up 
Mm. Delicious. <laughs> Number five, imagine a world where Halloween isn't on October 31st. That's just wrong. At or least not it? every year. Is it right? If the 57,000 people who signed the petition on change.org have their way, Halloween would be changed to a floating holiday on the last Saturday of October. And for the reason behind this, they cite safety issues with after dark trick or treating, and that Halloween could be celebrated for a whole weekend instead of a few rest weekday hours. Or at least a whole weekend day. They could have stuff for the kids during the day, and people could party all night and sleep in on Sunday without having to, you know, worry about an early morning weekday after partying. And if you want to sign this petition, we'll have a link in the show notes. So, what do you think? Good idea? Bad idea? I think it's kind of an interesting idea, um, and I kind of favor it for those reasons. The tradition, of course, is it's got to be on the 31st, but who says if we all decided to change it. But would we? Why hmm. would? <laughs> well, it's not a national holiday, like a legally recognized federal holiday, like Christmas or well, Thanksgiving. Well, Christmas is always on December 25th. But you get a holiday like Easter, it follows a, a Jewish calendar thing, and it's on a different date every year. Then you get things like Martin Luther King Day, that's always on a Monday somewhere around the middle of January, but you never know what day. It's not his birthday exactly. They just holidays are complicated. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. But if we all collectively decided to do this, we could. Well, where I'm from, we didn't always have Beggar's Night on Halloween. And I had never heard of that Sometimes before. it would be on the 29th or the 30th or the 31st. I don't remember it ever being in November, but it's not always on the 31st for Beggar's Night. I remember going to Ohio in the first ha Halloween that I lived in Ohio, and it was like, you know, what night is trick-or-treating? Well, uh, Halloween, when else would it be? <laughs> I did not know <laughs> not that always. was a thing. I'd never heard of that. Yeah, I think in Ohio they try to avoid the weekends. They always, when I was growing up, it was always, 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 and I still resent it to this day, always on a school night. Mm. So you'd get home from trick or treating and you'd have a half an hour to sort through your candy and then you have to go to bed because you got to get up the next morning. And you're all buzzed up on sugar, of course. Well, yeah. You can't sleep, yeah. Okay, so change.org is one of those sites that help you sign up for things that never happen and never goes anywhere. But if you want to sign the petition, it's still out there. It's still out there. So vote for your holiday. And that's the news. Have you seen any good movies lately? Any old movies? Like from 1971? I have. I saw The Abominable Dr. Fibes. Now, I saw this before. I think I might have seen it when it came out. I was like six. I vaguely remember one of them being, t I, I don't know if it was the first one or the second one. I remember being a wee lad and seeing them at the theater. There's something wrong with your parents. Yeah, yeah. They had, <laughs> they had very few restrictions on what movies they took this little lad to. Okay, so let's talk about that. And this week for our drive-in special, we're going to drive in way back in time to one of the classiest of classic horror movies, 1971's The Abominable Dr. Fibes. And it is classy. It looks good. It looks good. It sounds good. It's got to be one of the most artsy kind of horror movies that ever. Almost a dark comedy. Dark comedy horror movie. A lot of those movies from the early 70s were like that. They were so scary, they had to put the funny parts in as relief. Set in 1925. Which I did not know. I've seen this movie lots of times, and I never knew it was supposed to be set in 1925. I didn't pick up on that before either, but the, it clearly is. The things like the phonograph and the clockwork men and the projections and things like that, that in 1925, that makes this almost like a sci-fi movie. Yeah, the mechanisms and technology that he had. Well, he's a genius, Dr. Vibes. Yeah. Inventor and all-around madman. And I'm surprised there are so many people who have not seen this movie. It's easily of the quality of, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, or any of those kind of classics. But It's awesome. There were only two of these. Initially going to be three, but the third one never happened. That's a crime. Yeah. Speaking of crime, this is a revenge flick of the best kind. 
He is taking the Old Testament vengeance out on a team of surgeons that failed to save his life. Yeah. Yeah, and if we haven't mentioned it yet, The Abominable Dr. Fibes is, of course, played by Vincent Price, one of my favorites from that time period. And his nemesis is Dr. Vesalius, played by Joseph Cotton. Okay, so the movie starts with the credits. Uh, Dr. Fibes is a world-famous, world-class organist, and we see him playing his organ as the credits roll. Very reminiscent of uh, Phantom of the Opera vibe. Very much. The organ rises up from the floor, and it's a very beautiful deco-style chamber that he's in. Turns out that that's his secret lair, more or less. Not so secret. Everybody seems to know where it is there at the True. end. True. Well, it's his mansion, but everybody thinks he's dead, so they don't come looking. So as the credits finish and the organ music stops, we get treated to Dr. Fibes Clockwork Wizards, a musical group of completely clockwork musicians. Pretty cool people. And then in, in enters Vovania in the first of many elaborate costumes that she wears i think she was wearing something different in every scene almost every scene yeah very stylish big flowing dresses and over the top uh big big head dresses and fur hats and you know just over the top style and fashion one of the detectives later on describes her as fashionable and that's an under understatement <laughs> oh yeah. yeah yeah some kind of definitely modeling career going there want to be so anyway she is his sidekick who never says anything. Never speaks, never talks, does everything she's instruct. Well, he never really instructs her to do her anything. She just kind of knows. They just work together perfectly. And I read uh, that originally in the original script that they had in mind for her to be a clockwork mechanism, too. But then once they actually started and started working on it in the screenplay, they realized that wouldn't work. So they just have her as a silent assistant whatever she is she's a mystery they clearly say that fibes did not have any children and there's no reason that he would have a musical groupie or anything so who is she or what is she it's very strange that she's so completely devoted and so completely involved with the murders that he's carrying out and it's never explained it is never explained she's just there to assist and be interesting to look at <laughs> Okay, so also interesting is Dr. Fibes' car. He's driving one of these old 1920s car, but his windows are painted with his face because you don't want to see his real face. He does wear a mask over his true face. And, you, and there's a shot early on of him putting his prosthetics on. Ears, nose, lips. You know from the beginning that Vincent Price isn't his real face. There's something else under there. But you don't get to see what until the end. There's no dialogue at all for the first ten minutes of the movie. And he doesn't speak until about half an hour into it. And well over 30 minutes. Even when he speaks, he plugs himself in. There's a plug in the side of his neck, and he plugs it into like a Victrola machine it's that he has made. It's explained somewhere into it that... While his wife was dying on the operating table, he was rushing to the op rushing to the hospital from Switzerland where his car went over the cliff and he burned to death. Or so they think. Or so they think. Clearly there's some real damage there as Fibes cannot speak normally without this plug in the side of his head. And there's an awesome scene where he's drinking champagne with Vovania and pours the champagne into the side of his neck because his mouth doesn't work at all. So Vincent Price's lines were sort of dubbed for all of this. Yeah, Peter Cotton and his scenes uh, are really the only dialogue scenes between Fibes and another person. And uh, he doesn't actually speak. His lips aren't moving. Uh, somebody else, I guess, read Fibes' lines while Cotton answered. And then they dubbed Vincent Price's voice over later. And it's very, really very well done. It is, yeah. It's a very cool effect. So the highlight of the movie is the revenge, and Fibes, fi Fibes has a plan. He's going to follow the ten biblical plagues on each of these doctors. So the first doctor is killed with bats. No, the first one's actually bees. Well, the first one we see is bats. Yes, yes. That's mentioned that there was a doctor previously killed by bees, and how strange that was. 
And the bees, of course, stung the man and made it look like he was covered in boils, which is another one of those plagues. Right. One of the more fun ones is the frog death. The man, doctor goes to a costume party. Didn't realize it was a costume party. And uh, the doctor is a psychiatrist, a head shrinker. <laughs> yeah, he, he self-describes himself as a head shrinker. So he puts on this frog mask that Dr. Fibes hands him, puts it on, and you can see the little gadget in the back is clicking, 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 and the mask is shrinking. Squishes and his head. Squick. Yeah. Yeah. At the party. There is a head shrinker for you. Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't a pre-planned joke at all. <laughs> okay, about this time, the police start catching on to the, the, the pattern. They realize that something like this is going on. But at this point, they, talk, they run into the fourth doctor who dies. And this is a pervy old guy who's watching what amounts to pornography in 1920s. Very lame. Yeah, it's very funny. He gets this reel in the mail, and he's stealthily opening it. And it it's plays it on this hand crank uh, projection machine. And it's like an Egyptian girl kind of erotically dancing with a snake. Kind of a stripper. I mean, she's not... Okay, 1920s stripper. She's <laughs> very tame. Tamest porn ever. Yeah, very tame. Yeah. But he's all worked up over this as Volnavia walks into the room and she somewhat seduces him, tricks him into sitting in a chair, and he lets her tie him up. Because, ooh, you're a kinky girl, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Uh huh. He, well, he certainly He doesn't is. say that, but you can tell us what he's thinking. Yeah, yeah. Nobody really says anything. They just silently, he just silently sits in the chair. She ties him up. And once he's solidly bound in the chair, in walks Dr. Fibes and does this blood transfusion thing where he drains eight pints of blood out of the doctor. All of his blood, basically. Yeah, all of it. Drains him dry. Leaves it in jars on the mantle. Everything in the movie, all the murders, everything is very stylish. Oh, very very much. Very choreographed and well-dressed. And, yeah, he looks good doing this. (laughs) (laughs) He does. Okay, each, with each of these murders, he has with him a little amulet with some sort of Hebrew letter on it. And he takes the amulet after the person has died, puts it on a wax statue of the doctor, and melts the face of the doctor. This time, though, with the blood-drained doctor, he drops the amulet and leaves it by mistake. It's the only mistake he makes in this movie. And the detectives track that down. They take it to a goldsmith that happened to be the expert that made these emblems and then takes it to a rabbi, figures out that it's the ten plagues. And the rabbi explains that there are these ten curses. Bats, boils, frogs, blood, rats, hail, the beasts, locusts, death of the firstborn, and darkness. Ten plagues. But we know there are only nine doctors. What's up with that? We'll see. And it's about this point in the movie that Dr. Fibes has his first words. All this happens before he even speaks. And he's got a shrine set up to his dead wife, and he's talking to his dead wife, saying, you'll be avenged and we'll be together again. And the detectives are still on the case. He kind of alternates between him... And the detectives. Yeah, the te- detectives have a big part. And they're putting it together gradually. How about the rats in the airplane? That comes up next, doesn't it? Soon, soon. Yeah. First we get the hail. Oh, that's right, yes. They pull a guy over in his car and put a snow machine or an ice machine in the car with him. They crank it up to like 15, and the man freezes to death in the back seat of his car. And it's almost like this steampunk kind of uh, machine that's tied they plug it into the 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 guy's car engine and he's in the compartment in the back and frozen frozen solid 100 degrees below zero that's what the cop says at this point they put the pattern together they they question dr vesalius who recognizes that the only time all these doctors have worked together was on just one case mrs fibes mrs fibes so they know that somehow or another the Fibes family is involved with this. So they go check out the, the tomb, the Fibes mausoleum, and there are ashes in Dr. Fibes's tomb like they're supposed to be. But what do they find in hers? Nothing. She's not there. It's empty. So they know some funky business is going on there. About this time, we see the sixth, sixth death, which is rats on a plane. 
Hey, they should make a movie about that. They should. Rats on a yeah. plane. And the detective tries to chase down the plane before it takes off to warn the guy that he's in danger, but the car is too slow. plane takes off. Dr. Vibes and Vonavia are watching from a hilltop. He's got this big brass telescope watching the plane, and she's playing violin music in the background. <laughs> and all the deaths are like that. It's just, it's just really neat. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Stylish. they loaded up the plane with rats, which attacked the guy and caused it to crash, and that kills him. Moving on quickly, the seventh doctor is, uh, well, they know they're coming for him next. So they, they're gonna, the, the police are going to take him to his police safe house. <laughs> so he's all packed up, and they open the door to head out to the car. Poing! <laughs> <laughs> and somebody across the street has catapulted a brass unicorn, which impales the doctor right to the wall. Right to the wall. He's <laughs> nailed to the wall with a brass unicorn horn, shot by a catapult. Awesome. And I believe every bit of this. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Okay, we barely get to explain what happened with the unicorn guy until the probably the most elaborate one of the bunch, the eighth, the eighth death. And this was one of my favorite scenes. He has this huge wheelbarrow full of Brussels sprouts and greens, and Bonavius is just there watching him do his thing, and he's feverishly feeding them through this huge, elaborate, like Willy Wonka machine that's condensing all these vegetables down to a syrup. And it's just over the top how excited he is doing this and how elaborate this machine is. Nobody says a word, but it is hilarious. So now he's got this green, molasses-y looking sludge, and he takes it to the hospital where the nurse that helped kill his wife is locked in a room under heavy, heavy police guard. She's asleep. She can't she can't sleep because there's too many cops around, so she takes a sleeping pill. Well, he, how to explain it? He goes the, to the, f- the, the, the room, room upstairs. Above hers, drills a hole in the floor, runs all the syrup down all over her, and then releases a bunch of locusts into the room. And then the police finally come into the room, and she's reduced to a skeleton, basically, <laughs> because the locusts devoured her. The creativity of these uh, plots are just the best part. Which leaves number nine, the death of the firstborn. Dr. Vesalius says it couldn't be him. His older brother's been dead for years. But, but he has a beloved son at home. Who has been kidnapped and strapped down to a table by Dr. Fibes. If the doctor doesn't operate on him and remove the key that's been implanted near his heart, within six minutes, acid will drain down through the ceiling and splash and melt the boy to death very quickly. I think that the people who did Saw might have gotten some inspiration from that. It made me think of that. Very much I want to play a game. You've got this key embedded (laughs) in your chest. If you unlock this uh, collar around your neck, you can go free, but you have to cut your chest open to do it. (laughs) It's exactly like that. But the doctor is actually very talented and does manage to get the key and rescue the boy before the acid falls. Meanwhile, Fibes is working on making his big escape. Volnavia is tearing the place apart with an axe. A golden axe. A golden axe. Of course, because yes, you've got to do it in style. But at that point, the police rush in. They chase Volnavia into the operating room, where she kind of stupidly stands directly under the acid drip. Just as it releases. Melt, melting her and killing her off dead. Her only line, a scream. Ah! ah. Okay, so she's dead, the cops are there, the doctor has saved his son. Dr. Fibes, of course, is upstairs in his room. He doesn't realize all this has happened. He lays down with his dead wife in bed, sticks himself in the arm, and we very dramatically get to see his blood drain out and embalming fluid drain in. And we know it's embalming fluid because the jars are labeled embalming fluid. (laughs) (laughs) They want no So there's no question. (laughs) <laughs> so he embalms himself, goes to sleep, and the and the floor folds up on top of him so nobody can find the two bodies. And the cops and the doctor think he's just vanished. They can't figure out where he's gone. And they can't figure out what the tenth tenth curse was, the curse of darkness. Darkness. That was him in the in the sarcophagus. Well, on top of the hidden sarcophagus with him and his wife, 
there are some symbols of the sun and the moon and the earth, and the moon is eclipsing the sun, the giving you a hint that he'll be back during the next eclipse. And you know, there will be a sequel. So initially there wasn't going to be a sequel. They, uh, it didn't do very well at first. It didn't quite flop, but didn't do as well as they thought. And they changed up the marketing some, changed the poster. Uh, they started billing it as Vincent Price's 100th feature film, which was maybe true. Well, the initial advertising, the posters was him kissing his wife saying, love means never having to say you're ugly. Right. Which and it didn't sounds like a, a dumb sense. joke. Yeah. It was too comedic. Yeah. And they built it more as a horror movie. And then it succeeded a lot more. And then they said, hey, let's make a sequel. And while they were making the sequel, they had basically they decided they were going to make a third one. But as we'll see, eventually, they had a lot of arguments, fighting, and things changed at the studio, and the third one never happened. Sad. I bet it would have been good. There was even talk of making a Dr. Fibes TV series at one point. Oh, that would be cool. Where he reformed and fought crime. Okay, that'd be strange. That's just weird. That would be weird. <laughs> yeah. But this movie is really unique in the way it looks. For the, for the, its day and age, it's an old movie. Very colorful, very good sounds, very, very stylish. They put a lot into the wardrobe. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And the whole time you're rooting for Fibes, but you know what? Those doctors didn't do anything wrong. No, they did their best. You kept expecting them to say the doctors were all drunk or something. They didn't screw up or anything. They They, just tried and they They were good doctors who failed. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of rooting for the wrong guy here. I mean, they brought in a whole team of people to try to save this woman and couldn't. Yeah, so all along we've been rooting for the wrong guy. We should have been rooting for those doctors. Nah. They don't have the style. Yeah. Okay, so major thumbs up from me. Totally one of my long-term favorites. Same here. Yeah, I love this movie. We should see the second one. I think we should. And we should make the third one. Yes. Fan fiction. Yeah. Okay, so that was 1971's Doc, The Abominable Dr. Fibes. And first you have to learn how to say abominable. 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 That's how I learned how to say it. Abominable. Picture, picturing a literally a bull that has swallowed a bomb. A bomb in a bowl. Abominable. Huh. It took me a long time. That means Rudolph was fighting the abomb in a bowl snowman. Not just the bumble. That's right. Hmm. One other interesting thing that somebody pointed out in this, if you're a fan of the work of Edward Gorey, his animations, his uh, drawings, that in a lot of ways this is Edward Gorey brought to life in the style and the costuming and... I am not the familiar with humor. him at all. Oh, you should. Yeah, I should look up some of his stuff. Hmm. Yeah. And when somebody pointed that out, I said, yeah, they're right. Okay. I, yeah. Neat. For this week's short film, we look at 2012's The Storm, available on Netflix. We'll give you a link in the show notes. It was a Scream Fest official 2013 showing. Scream Fest being a short film competition. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was overall very good, I thought. It was. It looked good. It sounded good. It had good acting. A lot of people involved in it. The, the credits The credits were, ran and ran and ran. kind of long. A lot of people. They put a lot into it. A lot of effort. Good special effects. The story itself... Mm, yeah. Yeah. It was, a, it was short. It was 12 minutes. It would have made a good 12 minutes in any full-length horror movie. Standing by itself, it was a decent scene. It's a couple two. couple people trapped in a command center. At first, I wondered if they were even on Earth, but they are in the Arctic, and there's something, some creatures that are trying to bust in and get them. Initially, the, the main guy, he says that something has evolved, something has escaped, and now everything has gone to hell quickly. And you know he's a scientist because he's wearing a lab coat. Yeah, that's how you can tell. And the other, the other, the woman was a military type uh, uniform. So these evolved things that we don't know what they are are outside the base trying to beat their way in. And it was kind of science fictiony. The con- the command center was very high tech. Uh, did great big digital screen that was also a window to the outside. And there's security cameras all around the base. Motion sensors. Get knocked out one at a time. And we never see what's out there. 
Not at first. Not at first. But we do eventually. The military uh, officer wants to detonate the base, blow it all up, wipe everything out. The scientist, he wants to keep working. It's his life's work there, and he doesn't want to leave. Plus, they also figure out a way they can possibly escape. There's a remote control helicopter, all turned on, all charged up across on the other side of the base. Well, it's a full-size helicopter that they can fly remotely. Yeah. Another science fiction touch. So, the one... So, the military officer has been injured and can't run the remote, so the scientist guy has to do it. And together, they sort of get it done, trying to fly it in the windstorm. The storm, you know, it's a winter storm. But, just before they can make it land, the monsters attack. Break in. Break through the window, and the two get separated. And they're kind of zombie-ish. We're not, it's never really clear what they are. They're humans, somehow affected by something. Infected or defected or something. Or they're like 28 day later zombies. And they're kind fast. of they're kind of sensitive to sound, loud noises as a weakness. They, they track have. the vibrations. At one point the guy takes his shoes off so they don't hear him coming. Tippy toe, tippy toe. But firing a gun near them deafens them and stuns them for a minute. So they're overrunning the base and the officer decides she's going to crash the helicopter into the building and wipe them all out. So she does. She cr- crashes the helicopter into the building. Some of the mutants, or whatever they are, die. So the mutants run away. And the two main people are left behind to survive. So it's sort of a happy ending, a potentially happy ending. Well, they have to leave the base, and she says it's about a mi- the, the other base is a mile away in this really strong snowstorm. Will they make it? We don't know. Will they not? We don't know. Open-ended. So I thought the story was maybe a little weak and predictable. But acting, special effects, all that, production value, very good. What there was was very, very watchable. Good. I'd recommend it. Overall, thumbs up. Okay, and next up, we have our modern movie of the week, Bandersnatch. Yeah, Bandersnatch on Netflix. on Netflix. And this is the world's first interactive TV show, and we are going to review it for you. We were going to watch it on our TV. Our Apple TV. And a message comes up and says... It cannot be viewed in interactive mode on your TV. Right. You have to use a pad or a phone or a computer. Video game system. Video game system. So you can't watch it on TV. And it's a TV show. It's Netflix. Our Apple TV doesn't do it, and we even tried on an iPad using AirPlay. And it just won't show. So our review is, it doesn't work. Not on TV. We, it gives you the option of just watching it on TV without the interactive. And we didn't want to do it just on little pads or anything, so we don't review this. Maybe we'll have a review for it in a couple of episodes. Maybe we won't, but we are not thrilled with Bandersnatch. And we were very disappointed. Okay, so now for our real movie, we're going to look at the latest installment in the Hellraiser series. The tenth movie in the series. And how the mighty have fallen. Hellraiser Judgment, 2018. Well, it starts out with with Pinhead complaining. The cube is obsolete. With all this technology and debauchery in the world that, you know, the cubes just don't do it anymore. There are so many other ways to sate desires. So they find a way. They do. They work around it. The cubes still work. There, uh, there's this man. He's wandering around. He's homeless. And he's hiding out in this shack. Mr. Watkins is his name. And they slip him an envelope under the door. Come to this address, and we've got something for you. Watkins then goes to the address, goes inside, and he meets a new character, the Auditor. And if you can imagine what Pinhead's accountant would look like, that's this guy. His Nazi accountant that... Had a face German accent. Up. Yeah. Yes, yes, very Nazi-ish. Okay, a yeah. Nazi accountant. Yeah, but he's got this theme punk machine where he types in information and asks Watkins all these questions about his past. Oh, and it, and the best part is it uses their blood as ink. It's got a siphon that yeah. draws it up into the machine. It's kind of a neat scene. Yeah, but it turns out that Watkins is a pedophile and a child photographer, and he's done some bad stuff. So he's there to be judged. And... So the auditor is pleased with that mm-hmm. and passes him on to the assessor. Who's this fat guy who reads... He doesn't read the reports. He eats the reports that the auditor made. 
And depending on how sick he gets, that's how evil you are. Sounds like a fair, fair it's test. It's quite a system, yes. <laughs> of course, it makes him sick, and he goes over and pukes into a funnel. Yum. And the funnel gets filtered down and spews on to three women who are the jury. <laughs> it's very <laughs> weird. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> anyway, so that's how it starts out. This, you know, they this then is their send system him, now. They s- then <laughs> send him out to be cleaned inside and out. And as soon as he calls clean, he's all cleaned up. The surgeon comes in, which is yet another character, who peels his skin off, slices him up, and hey, then it's time for the credits. Yeah. So this all happens pretty quickly into it. It's quite an opening, and this movie is not rated. For gore, I can see why. It's pretty gory, pretty bloody. All the Hellraiser movies are pretty gory. This one might have been a little more. Maybe. But, but yeah. Okay, so anyway, the credits are rolling, and in this point we find out that Pinhead is played by Paul Taylor. Not... Doug Bradley. Not Doug Bradley this This is the third Pinhead there has been. Doug played him in the first eight... And then uh, Stephen Smith Collins played him in the ninth movie. And this is the tenth, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I knew there was one of those other ones that he wasn't in. It was very obvious it wasn't him. Yes, very. This guy looked pretty good in the role. Yeah, sounded good. Yeah, I thought that the guy in the ninth movie really wasn't that great. Mm-hmm. This guy was pretty good. Yeah. Okay, so the plot of the movie has nothing to do with any of that so far. That's just sort of a preview of things to come. There's a serial killer roaming the town, and he's called the Preceptor, and he does some pretty weird things to his victims. Biblical things, staged after he kills them. It's all religious-themed. Yes. (laughs) The first girl, for example, he kills her. He cuts her open and shoves her little dog inside her and sews the dog up. Because... That was her baby. The dog was her baby. So he sewed it into her womb. And born with a silver spoon, and so he literally gags her with a silver spoon. Later later on, there's a scene where they go to a playground and find eight dismembered hands, and each hand has an eye and a tooth in it. Mm -hmm. Because they were criminal. They were thieves. Thieves, yes. An eye for an eye and a tooth Tooth for a tooth. tooth And cutting their hands off. Okay, we don't want to go into all the different murders and things. But basically, there are three detectives out hunting this serial killer, and Pinhead and the auditor are wandering around doing their thing. And it was strange with the detectives. Were they police or were they not? The door to their office generically said detectives. At one point, the girl (laughs) detective came in and said, You two are running the worst detective agency I've ever seen. And yet, she had a badge. And they were in the police department. They kept showing the outside of the police department. And yet, it kind of seemed like they were just private investigators. It's like whoever wrote this had no idea how cops work. Or they had two different writers or some confusion there. Yeah, that that was just weird. But anyway, the two guys and their third one, Edgerton, are trying to solve the serial killer case. And in the meantime, some of them come into contact with Pinhead, and things start get taking a strange turn at that point. Very strange. Without yes. giving too many spoilers. Mm-hmm. Heather Langenkamp makes a brief appearance. She's got third billing in the opening credits. <laughs> she was Nancy in the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. And she was in this as third billing, so you'd expect her to have a decent role. It was about 45 seconds, maybe, as a landlord, landlady. And you'd barely recognize her with the way she was made up and tramped up. I didn't recognize her, and I kind of wasn't paying attention because when I didn't think the role was anything, and then it, she was gone. If you tried hard, you could tell, yeah, that's her, I guess. I was making a note on something and <laughs> looked away and missed her. Well, she's older now. Oh, she's older now for real, of course. Oh, yeah. And they had her, yeah, had her made up, and yeah, why, why third? I wonder how much she got paid for that. A role. name for the. Nobody. No. Who else was in this that you've heard of? Mm, she was at. Yeah, yeah. That's the big star. So what would you think overall? Overall, it was no f- first Hellraiser. They do expand the mythology a little bit. There's a few new characters in this one. And there's an angel in this Pinhead one. Pinhead has a boss. And they have uh, back and forth with uh, the good side, the Cenobites, and, uh, and an angel representative comes to visit a couple times. That's interesting. Yeah. 
Pinhead's good. The Auditor is good. The other Cenobites were kind of just thrown in there this time. Not really anything necessary, just... Uh, background stuff. Background. Yeah. Guard dog. Just there for the creep factor. Yeah, basically. And thoroughly good makeup. The whole look of the movie was really good. Creepy and atmospheric. Yeah, and looked fine. Yes. Uh, there's sort of a twist at the end. What would you think of that? Did you like it? I did. You yeah. did? Okay. Yeah. I, I started liking it. I, I started uh, halfway through. I was thinking, boy, I'm really not liking this at all. But then it picked up more and got more interesting. I think it builds more towards the end and got more interesting. And I liked it overall. I'm talking about the twist that happened in the last three minutes. After the credits? No, no, well, no. Oh, that twist. <laughs> okay, there may be more than one twist here. Okay, yes, there may be. So, the one that could so lead to the So we're trying to talk movie. in code without giving spoilers. <laughs> yes, I thought that was cool. Depends on how the next movie goes. If they if they pick that up and run with it, it could be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could. Yeah, or they very well could just say it never happened. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. So... They do that with sequels. Oh, yeah. They could make the next one say, oh, we're going to make this a direct sequel of the first movie. A prequel to the first <laughs> movie or something. Yeah. I liked the first movie. I liked the second movie. The third and fourth movies were yeah, decent enough, and they have gone downhill steadily since, I think. I think this one was I don't think this was the worst. The this was not the worst. No, no, I don't think so. That's high praise. Yeah. <laughs> I would say probably maybe the fourth or fifth best movie out of ten. I would rank it in the top half. I'd give it the fifth best. I've seen all the, of them for I think sure. the first four were the best, and then this was number five. Okay. Six, seven, eight, and nine, yeah. avoid like the plague. Meh. Yeah. Hell if you have a choice of watching six seven, or six, seven, eight, and nine, or actually going to hell, think about it. Hellraiser in Space was, I think, the silliest one, <laughs> where they had the robot opening the cube, or, you know, with the remote hands. And... Well, they had Jason in Space, too. That was cool, though. All the something in space movies are just out there. They're kind of getting desperate at that point. Yes. Yes, they are. Okay, so I would give Hellraiser Judgment a 4 out of 10. I'd give it a 6.5 out of 10. Okay. If you're a big fan of the series, you have to see it, but don't have much in the way of expectations. You know, they had five caterers and two craft services companies helping them on this movie. I always see that. What is a craft services company? Food. It's where they come in and basically set up a buffet of food and everybody comes in. and Or, or you know, like the, the hot steaming trays you know where you line up and there was something hot and steaming about this movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway craft services are the the ones that feed a mass group of people okay and you do need to see it after there is an after credit scene yeah you don't do. forget the yeah. after credit yeah. scene keep watching it looks like the sun is starting to come up so we're gonna have to get going the drive-in is closing down for the weekend Stop in during the week at www.horrorbulletin.com for news and horror updates, to comment on the podcast, or to contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Check us out at Horror Bulletin on Twitter. We've got a very active Twitter account going on there with lots of good stuff. Mm -hmm. Chime in there. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And pick up your snacks before you leave the drive-in. Drive back in next weekend. See ya. See ya.